Welcome to the Control Engineering webcast, How Cobots Can Be Leveraged in the COVID-19 Age, sponsored by Universal Robots. I'm your moderator, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly over the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with the audio or slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for our speaker today in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents also will be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Joe Campbell. Joe is a 40-year veteran of the robotics industry. After executive assignments in sales, marketing, customer service, and operations, Joe is now head of America's marketing and application development for Universal Robots. He regularly speaks to industry groups, associations, conferences, and state and local governments on the benefits of robotic automation. Joe, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mark. Glad to be here and always glad to talk with you. Today, we're going to explore not just collaborative automation, but we're going to talk about how it's being deployed in this uh, rather challenging time of the COVID pandemic. Some of the audience may not be very uh, familiar with collaborative automation, so I thought I'd take just a few moments at the front to talk about what some of the fundamental differences are. And as you can see here, in just even in simple appearance, they're, they're quite, quite different technologies. So here's a very, very nice summary slide. So first of all, uh, collaborative robots are um, intrinsically safe and able to safely operate alongside humans in a shared workspace. Now, this also implies that there's been a proper risk assessment. And if you have any questions about where to learn about risk assessments, we can handle that question at the end of the presentation. Second key point is that collaborative technology is very uh, very easy to program. It's routinely deployed by people with no previous coding experience or robotics experience or automation experience. Collaborative technology is very flexible and it's easy to redeploy based on the easy programming and setup. And it is easy to set up even in a very first application. The out-of-box experience is very clean. Uh, in the case of our products, they're just 120 volt power uh, and so no special power requirements. The other key attribute for collaborative technology is that there are limited space requirements because there's no safety guarding required, uh, and again, in a proper installation. Uh, the safety guarding is uh, not only expensive, but it does consume significant amounts of floor space, and as we'll see here later on, can be a real barrier to implementing uh, automation. And finally, all these attributes sum up to deliver cost-effective automation. Uh, collaborative robot cells are typically one-third to one-half the cost of traditional automation. And that's important because it makes them viable in high-mix, low-volume operations that were previously very, very difficult to automate. Now, we have a very short video here that will give you some idea of the impact of collaborative technology and what kind of returns real manufacturing customers are achieving.
first started looking into automation, I was surprised to find that we could afford a six-axis robot uh, and a collaborative one at that. I assumed those systems cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. The return on investment on uh, uh, our initial system uh, was less than two months. The return on investment is less than a year, probably about seven months. The ROI on the robot was probably about a four-month return. For the ROI on purchasing the robot, it's slightly less than a year, actually. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. With the price you can buy the universal robot for, it's stuff that you're willing to invest knowing how quickly you can get the ROI back on it. To give an idea of ROI investment, you're looking at a savings of about 34 days it takes to get the robot paid for, to justify the means of buying that robot. We estimate the ROI was about six months uh, at its current configuration. So in case of robots, we found that in just 14 months, the robot will pay for itself. The ROI on the robot, I would say the robot itself, payback was less than four months. These robots are probably five times as cheap, or one-fifth the cost of, of a traditional industrial robot. We think that this system will pay back for itself in under six months. And that's just based by the cost savings and increased output that it provides. All right. I hope that was uh, I hope that was enlightening. So let's talk a little bit about the motivation for collaborative technology or cobots. First of all, you see some of the very traditional benefits that factory automation brings, uh, whether it's traditional or collaborative. But the number one issue that we're continuing to attack is manufacturing the labor. Uh, the other benefits for productivity and the throughput and extra capacity and machine utilization, et cetera, are completely valuable. But right now, one of the biggest barriers we still see in the industry is manufacturing labor. Talking to production managers, plant managers, operators, and owners, they still acknowledge, even in today's environment, that it's very difficult to hire, expensive to train, and difficult to keep people in the manufacturing sector. Now, the COVID-19 impact has been horrific on our economy. And it's uh, very painful to note that there are tens of millions of people unemployed. Unfortunately, these, this heavy, heavy unemployment is not translating into a skilled manufacturing workforce committed to manufacturing. Uh, we see major issues with skills gap and training costs and frankly, career preference. Many of the people that are currently unemployed had made career choices that did not include manufacturing. Long term, we will see an economic recovery and all those underlying manufacturing labor issues will remain and actually come back very, very harshly. The challenge with manufacturing labor is that it is a demographic issue. It's not an unemployment issue. And the demographic issue is unfortunately driven by people like me. I am a baby boomer and there are approximately 10,000 of us each day that are retiring. Right now, baby boomers 55 years and older represent 27% of the manufacturing workforce in the US. That's a significant number, and it's compounded by the fact that the younger generations, millennials, Gen Xers, or whatever label you choose to put on them, are not particularly interested in filling the jobs that are being vacated by boomers. Part of it has actually been a long-term building. Deloitte did a study and found that 83% of the, the population thought manufacturing jobs were important to the economy, but less than a third would encourage their children to pursue jobs in manufacturing. Now, these numbers, 
you know, statistics were here prepared before the COVID crisis. So the timing may be slightly off, but it is undeniable that the demographic changes that are underway are going to really cause a significant shortage in manufacturing workforce uh, in the next decade. Uh, that will have to be reckoned with. So now let's talk about COVID-19 business and where collaborative robots and collaborative technology fit. So first of all, worker safety and social distancing is paramount. Factories across the country and around the world actually are wrestling with layout problems, trying to give their employees uh, proper social distancing to increase their safety factors. We're seeing significant reshoring as companies realize that having a single supply line that extends halfway around the world is actually a risky proposition. So we see companies bringing back partial or complete manufacturing lines uh, back to their domestic locations. And finally, flexibility. I think this uh, crisis has taught all of us that flexibility in manufacturing is far more important than we previously assumed. And uh, we're seeing a significant investment from companies that are actually trying to build in flexibility to manage the next challenge. So now I'm going to go through a, a number of, uh, of topics around collaborative technology and a number of features that actually help collaborative robots fill these three uh, gaps in uh, the current manufacturing process. So first of all, traditional automation uh, is what I call all or nothing proposition. Um, the traditional robot industry was, uh, was actually formed and uh, heavily influenced today uh, in the automotive industry. And in the automotive industry, that whole philosophy of all or nothing was really deeply rooted. Um, it was compounded by the strict safety standards and the guarding requirements and very, very costly floor space in uh, automotive body shops or uh, sub-assembly shops. What that meant is projects really required every process step to be automated. And as you can see from the two pictures on the right, there's really no opportunity for skilled human operators to participate in any of these processes, regardless of how complicated they may be. And quite often what we found was the most demanding process step, the most demanding 10% of the project could drive 20, 30, or even 40% of the project cost, which made traditional automation available only to certain classes of customers and it made it extremely difficult to justify and pay back. Collaborative technology or cobots are what we call incremental automation. Again, I like the tagline of automation even a CFO can like. In a 10 step process, you don't have to automate the entire line at once. You can pick one process step, automate it and start to generate return on investment and then pick another step and so on. And we see this, this repeated uh, throughout our customer base very, very successfully. Uh, it, it reduces upfront capital spend. It generates immediate savings. Uh, and it allows lines to evolve uh, as, as uh, processes change and product mix changes. Collaborative automation is also a major contributor to improved OEE and OLE. And for those of you who don't recognize those terms, that means overall equipment effectiveness and overall labor effectiveness. And it really speaks to the, to the efficiency and the availability uh, of the manufacturing process. A study done by MIT concluded that human robot collaboration is 85% more productive than either humans performing a process alone or attempting to do it with robots alone. So the combination of collaborative robot technology and skilled human operators is proving to be the most efficient approach. I think the other dynamic that we have to talk about is that cobots are reaching totally new classes of customers. Uh, these are customers that are typically new to automation. 
Uh, they don't typically have a automation or robotics engineering department or specialists on staff. And quite often they're called SMEs, small and medium enterprises. And this is a segment that has historically been underserved by factory automation. Uh, the traditional automation is very, very difficult to introduce into a small shop based on uh, the complexity and the technology and the requirement for dedicated specialized staff functions. Now, this is important to manufacturing on the whole because of the sheer volume of small manufacturing firms. In 2016, there were approximately a quarter million firms in the U.S. that were in the manufacturing arena. About 90% of them had less than 100 employees, putting them right in that small, medium enterprise range. And this has been a real significant part of the growth of collaborative robot technology. The other concept that has emerged is, is this concept of robot as a tool. A traditional automation uh, really requires a dedicated uh, robots, dedicated cells, dedicated processes, uh, just because of the overall cost uh, and the safety guarding and the relative inflexibility. With collaborative technology, this concept of robot as a tool has emerged and it's really uh, gained a lot of traction in job shops and contract manufacturing environments, whether it's a contract assembly or welding or packaging, uh, injection molding, et cetera. In many of these plants, we see fleets of our robots deployed on mobile carts and they are moved from machine to machine depending on the day's or week's production schedule. And so it is the ultimate in flexibility. It's even evolved into a rapidly emerging and, and growing very quickly, a rental market. You can actually rent uh, robotic palletizers, uh, robotic material handling cells, machine loaders, and welding cells uh, by the month, week, or day. And in fact, in one case, the company offers them by the hour. Uh, you actually only pay for that collaborative robot when it is actually in production. Collaborative automation has also brought a real different uh, paradigm in uh, training. The training for traditional automation has always been an expensive proposition. It was usually done over a period of weeks uh, at the supplier's uh, location, uh, which meant that you not only had to send your team members uh, to the training and pay the travel uh, cost associated with it, but they were also out of the production environment for that one or two or three week period. Universal pioneered a process that we call the UR Academy. It's online training and it's available uh, at no charge uh, at our website. Uh, to date, we've trained over 100,000 users from 130 countries. And the UR Academy is actually taught in 16 different languages. The core modules, are, again, all online training, can be covered in as little as two hours to give a user the fundamentals of operating and fundamental programming of the universal cobot. Now, in addition to that, we've also opened up 61 authorized training centers. But again, the difference here is we're working with our distribution partners uh, to bring those training centers very, very close to the customer further reducing that cost and disruption of training if in fact they would like to go with face-to-face -face training. Another tool that has really changed the way we look at automation and is very important for these COVID case studies we're going to talk about is the application builder. For straightforward fundamental applications, you can actually make a series of menu choices, typically based on the graphical elements that you see here, to configure a robot cell for machine tending or palletizing or case packing, et cetera. The output from the application builder is a series of programming templates, so you actually generate the code as you set up the cell. Uh, a series of how-to instructions and recommendations, 
in a functional simulation so you can actually see how the robot's going to perform in production. And this has been very effective in actually slashing the engineering time and cost for a typical project. Another function that's actually designed to reduce uh, engineering time and cost is called UR Plus. And this is our program that kind of mimics the, uh, the app store where you go to get apps for your, your uh, cell phone. Uh, for UR Plus, we actually have a whole series of peripherals and accessories that were developed by third party companies. But they are truly plug and play. They've been validated and certified by Universal. We publish the specifications, mechanical, electrical, and software. And the partner companies develop their products around those specs. And then we test and validate to ensure that they work properly uh, with, our, with our robots. There are now over 250 products in the UR Plus ecosystem, everything from grippers to vision systems to robot coverings, sensors, et cetera. And you can see here, these are blue chip companies. If you're in the automation business, many of these companies are gonna be very familiar to you. Uh, and these are all partner companies that have developed products under the UR Plus uh, program. And what that enables a user to do is to quickly uh, select an accessory or a peripheral with high, high, high confidence that it's going to operate properly uh, and interface to the robot with no special engineering or no custom programming code. Now, we've even extended this concept further. The examples that I used previously were mostly what we call components. Again, a gripper is a component of a cell. It's not a solution. UR Plus application kits are moving closer to a complete solution. And I can show you two examples here. The first is the finishing kit from a longtime partner, Robotique. This leverages Robotique's Force Copilot software. They have multiple options for the sanding head. The kit includes uh, all the mounting hardware and peripherals for air control and documentation. And most importantly, they've developed a very, very sophisticated uh, programming tool that allows you to program very complex sanding protocols, even on contoured surfaces, with just a handful of points. A typical complex programming like this could take, in traditional world, it could take days, perhaps a week, and with the Robotique finishing kit is literally a matter of 15 to 20 minutes of programming. So it's a good example where they've taken an application area and delivered about 90% of the final solution. Another product in a similar vein is actually from Universal. It's called Akinav, and it is a bin picking solution, a 3D precision bin picking solution. It's targeted at, at uh, machine tending, machine loading uh, applications where registration of the part is critical for the load process. And in the case of Acunav, it includes a 3D sensor, a motion uh, planner, computer, and again, all the peripherals uh, to mount uh, and, and enable everything to operate very, very quickly. Again, just like the Robotique solution in this case, uh, bin picking can be boiled down to a matter of one to two hours of setup for a new part, uh, and quite often less than that. So all this combines to a concept that we call rapid deployment robotics. It's very, very common for us to see systems being installed turnkey within four weeks from the purchase order to start a production. And again, it's how we reduce cost is, a, is, is common with how we reduce uh, deployment time. You have to attack every step of the process. Everything from our robot lead times, our typical delivery is seven days from purchase order to delivery, some, quite often less. But we try to reduce engineering and reduce programming time, reduce training time, and reduce all the work on site uh, where the robot's gonna be installed. 
So today you'll see collaborative robot technology in every industry and in every application segment that you've seen traditional automation. And, and those numbers are continuing to expand. Now let's segue and talk a little bit specifically about applications in the COVID environment and what features and functions are leveraged to enable this uh, class of automation to solve the current problems. So as I mentioned before, social distancing is definitely a challenge. Companies are trying to figure out how they can, how they can provide social distancing to their employees in the manufacturing environment without wholesale redesign and relayout of their factories. And in many cases, that's just, even if it was financially feasible, it's just not possible in very tight footprints. So today we are seeing companies purchase multiple units with the specific intent to automate processes along the line to allow separation between their staff. And you can see in the checkbox on the right, these type of installations leverage the features that I talked about earlier, uh, those that are checked. Now here's a good example. DCL Logistics is a, is a uh, B2C logistics order fulfillment company. And as soon as the pandemic really got traction and, and people really changed their shopping and buying patterns, a DCL saw a 30% increase in their business within 60 days. Now their traditional approach would be to hire temporary workers to meet these demand surges, such as they would see around Christmas, for example. However, in this current environment, DCL did not want to increase COVID exposure from rotating temp workers in and out of their operations. Right? That was something that was very difficult for them to comprehend and they wanted to protect their current workforce. The solution, they quickly deployed a second uh, UR10 based order fulfillment cell. Right, and this order fulfillment cell actually interfaces with the company's ERP system and goes through a series of pick processes to actually build up a unique and custom order. Their productivity increased by 500%. The Cobot cell exceeded the typical production of five temporary positions. The ROI was three months and it reduced the labor content on each order by half. Their productivity increase and cost reduction allowed them to meet this increased demand from customers without passing any price increases on, which is what other logistics and order fulfillment companies were doing. So they were one of the very, very few that did not have to renegotiate their SLAs during the pandemic, and it's become a major competitive di differentiator for them. And more importantly, their workforce uh, feels far safer uh, with this current setup that allows social distancing and kind of keeps their team uh, very cohesive and very tight together. Another example in social distancing is a company that was featured in the video, All Access Machining. All Access is a 20 person contract machine shop and fabricator just outside of Dallas. They are the typical of so many small shops, right? They just did not have much floor space and consequently the machines were packed very close to each other. Uh, and they were struggling to really understand how to run the business while keeping social distancing between their shop labor, while keeping the machine tools operational and running. It was to the point they were actually turning away orders because their uh, COVID spacing requirements had reduced their capacity. It meant they had machines down because they couldn't operate uh, concurrently with labor, uh, with uh, social distancing requirements, and they had very, very low utilization. Now, they had already deployed some UR robots, and this compelled them to deploy more. So now they have a total of eight doing machine tending tasks. 
what it allowed them to do was actually have fewer people in the shop while at the same time increasing productivity. They added a weekend shift to support the staff spread. They also added a lights out third shift, letting the machines operate with robots loading and unloading parts from magazines uh, with, with no machine operators present. At the end of this rework of their whole process, their utilization and productivity are higher than ever before. Their capacity has increased, which is helping them meet critical customer needs. A very, very direct improvement to the bottom line. And this is a quote from the owner, I should have done this much sooner. And again, most important thing is that their employees feel comfortable going to work. They view all access, even in a small shop, high density shop like this, as a very safe environment. Now let's talk about reshoring. As I mentioned earlier, reshoring is really being driven from a number of challenges. Many companies had offshored production of maybe key components or just uh, multiple components in a final assembly. And I think in the in the early days of the pandemic, as it evolved, we actually saw border shut down. Uh, we saw shipping shut down. Uh, air freight was shut down. And so consequently, a lot of companies found their supply chains totally severed and they were unable to produce their products because they couldn't get components from their offshore, uh, offshore manufacturing. So companies are working hard to bring manufacturing back and reshore it. Uh, reshoring leverages all the features that I talked about before, as you can see in the boxes checked on the right hand side. Because okay, you're essentially trying to deploy uh, a complete new manufacturing line um, in very short order. I think a great example is a company called Hometex. Hometex is a company that makes, um, they make textile products uh, for the home. So think about uh, bed sheets, comforters, pillows, curtains, um, fabrics that you would find around your home or in living areas. In April of this year, their management team made the decision to add a new product line, disposable high-performance face masks to their business. And again, this is, a, this is a big company. They actually have facilities in both China and India, uh, still privately held, so they could reach this decision very quickly. A key element in their decision was to reshore the PPE manufacturing. That was a very, very high objective for them. To meet that uh, objective, they actually have invested $5 million, adding 15 manufacturing lines, which will give them the capacity to build, manufacture 350 masks, million masks per year. It's bringing between 80 and 120 uh, new jobs to the Coleman, Alabama area. Where they're installing this plant. And immediately the company is already struggling to hire manufacturing labor. So in this case, they're automating the end of line case packing and palletizing uh, at the end of the manufacturing lines. And the automation has been an integral part of their plan since they first conceived uh, of this project. And it's all to reshore or avoid offshoring um, operations. It would have been an easy process for them to go deploy this in one of their plants in China or India, uh, but they were definitely motivated to bring it back here to the U.S. Last area we'll talk about is manufacturing flexibility. And you can see the features on the right-hand side that are that get leveraged when we're trying to deploy rope cobots for flexibility. I think what the pandemic has taught everybody is that the product mixes will can change radically and very volatilely. And having flexible automation allows manufacturers to meet those challenges. And we have a couple good examples to look at. 
RCM Industries is a company that manufactures and machines die cast parts. They've got four plants in greater Chicago, uh, and they already have multiple universal robots in operation. They were tested and challenged because they actually had a COVID outbreak in one of their plants, which forced an immediate, temporary, but immediate shutdown. They had to relay out their manufacturing processes to get social distancing before they could start back up. And they were challenged because, again, the staff that was available to work and that one wanted to work uh, in the other plants might not have been as familiar with the universal cobots um, as they would like. So their solution, they actually invested in additional automation, in this case, two new cobots, each are tending a pair of dual spindle CNC lays. What that enabled them to do is implement social distancing, reducing the operators per cell from three to one. And the ease of use of the product and the online academy for training allowed these staff members who had previously not been familiar with cobots have to have no issue in picking up their new assignments. The other benefit is they started to understand how to leverage flexible cobot automation, and it gave them the ability to uh, compete with overseas manufacturing in areas where a shortened supply chain was critical, where local manufacturing was critical to their customer base and quick turnaround and quick lead time was critical. So it has actually helped them grow their business. Another good example is a company called GAM Precision, machine shop in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, typical very high mix and low volume shop. Their CNC operators are doing both setup and load and unload operations, which is not particularly efficient. And what that meant is their machine utilization was fairly low uh, because they had skilled CNC operators that were doing everything. They were doing setup and load and unload. It limited their, uh, their overall business capacity and it was compounded painfully with the COVID-19 social distancing requirements when similar to all access, they were unable to work in close proximity. The solution, they quickly deployed, this is in a matter of, of three weeks, they deployed a UR10 with a pro cobots feeder from a certified systems integrator uh, called Fusion Cobotics out of the Chicago area. They restructured their manufacturing workflow, it had immediate impact on machine utilization. They added production hours uh, on a second shift unmanned to complete jobs that normally would have taken two days. They could now complete them before the next morning shift started. The additional capacity helped them increase sales. It also facilitated social distancing on the factory floor. And now they've retooled their new model is to have a single skilled CNC operator to perform setups on multiple machines with cobots doing the load and unload functions. Another good example is a company called Pepri in Spain. It's a plastic manufacturer in the Alicante region. Uh, early in the pandemic, if you recall, Spain was hit very hard, extremely hard. In fact, they had one of the, uh, the highest uh, levels of outbreak across Europe. Uh, consequently, they ran out of hospital beds. And Pepri is a company that actually manufactures hospital beds. And they had to ramp their production up actually double their production very, very quickly. So in a matter of weeks, they deployed another cobot to trim blow molded uh, components, including the lateral supports and the headboards and the footboards. Uh, they put the second robot in production within three weeks to meet the increased demand. It was very successful. And finally, I put this one in just because I find it so interesting. You may recognize some of these people. Uh, this is Espen Ostergaard on the lower right. 
Uh, he was the chief technology officer and one of the founders of Universal Robots. And that is his wife, Risha, on the upper left. And they have worked with a company called Lifeline Robotics with, that they are invested in. And they have actually come up with a swab and testing cell based on the collaborative robot technology. It's got a custom end effector, a standard out of the box UR3 cobot arm, picks up the swab uh, after the patient scans his, his or her ID card. Robot then uses the vision system to actually identify the points to swab inside the patient's throat. And again, because we're talking collaborative technology, that this is still safe. And once the swab is complete, the robot takes the sample, puts it in a jar. And so here you can see cobot technology actually automating uh, the very process of testing. So I have final observations about where cobots fit uh, in this environment. So first of all, the labor crisis that we've been wrestling with for some years now, compounded with the COVID pandemic, uh, has really accelerated change. It's accelerated how people are thinking about manufacturing and manufacturing processes and automation and collaborative technology. We're continuing to see heavy growth of automation in the small and medium enterprises and in high mix, low volume operations of all sizes. Okay. These, these types of firms are now realizing that automation is a key to their success. There's a definite focus on flexibility to handle production mix, manufacturing schedules, and new product introductions. Current jobs that have a high DDD, which is dull, dirty, and dangerous, high DDD content are being automated. And what we're starting to see now is that new processes from the beginning are automating anything that's perceived as dull, dirty, and dangerous. What that translates into is what I call the ongoing transition manufacturing labor into higher skilled, higher value processes. And particularly important in this environment, if there's a shortage of labor availability, you certainly want those skilled workers uh, applying value to the, to the highest value processes. That's my formal presentation. And with that, I am happy to turn it back over to Mark Hosky and we're going to see if we can uh, find some questions from uh, the, uh, the audience. Thank you, Joe, for your presentation, uh, advice, and many examples. That was fun. Uh, we do have time for questions. The audience may type questions for the presenter in the Ask a Question box on the screen, and we'll get to as many as questions allow. I already see uh, some good ones coming up. Uh, questions that we don't have time for today will be posted online at www.controleng.com with the archived version of this webcast. Remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation using the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. And now on to the, uh, the questions and answers. So uh, are you finding instances where adding robots actually increases uh, human employment? Uh, many cases because uh, it's it's making companies uh, far more competitive. Um, I think we see it quite often, particularly in the small and medium enterprise. Uh, in those companies, quite often, their ability to grow is really gated by uh, their ability to hire. And uh, as I said before, that's been quite a challenge. And so uh, automating can actually help increase a company's capacity and actually help increase employment. Um, I'll give a, a concrete example. The small company that I mentioned a couple times, All Access Machining, when they bought their first cobot, uh, they were a 16 person shop. And now they're a 20 person shop and they're looking to hire again. And that is really directly attributed to the automation improving their business. That is great news, makes them more competitive and, and allows them to bring in more business. 
Absolutely. Um, uh, another question, I'd like to know more about safety details for collaborative uh, robot safety standard. How will we defend an employer if an accident happens if there's no fence at all? Um, I'm in Canada, the, que the questioner asks. Yeah, well, the key, the key thing, uh, whether it's uh, Canada, Mexico, or the U.S., the, the key component here is the risk assessment. Um, and a risk assessment is, is nothing more than a structured review of what could go wrong and how to mitigate those problems. Um, now, the cobots themselves, and in our case, we actually have 17 different safety protocol settings. Uh, so the, the safety uh, response can be really tailored to the actual application and the installation. Uh, but I think the key is to have the risk assessment and um, and deploy the cobot properly, and that is the, the the best protection you can have. Right, and in some situations, it it may need an enclosure depending on what the robot is handling. Absolutely. Uh, right now, a little over eighty percent of the robots that we sell uh, are deployed without any kind of barrier or sensors. Uh, the other twenty percent are either uh, protected by sensors, scanners. Uh, or in some very, very rare areas by uh, by enclosures. Uh, and I think what we're finding, particularly in the companies that use traditional automation heavily, um, they they may or may not be attracted to the collaborative nature uh, of the cobots, but they're very much attracted to the ease of use uh, factor. And so in those cases, we may find a, a cobot behind a, behind a barrier. Very good. Uh, how difficult is the, the programming of new motions or, or processes? What would be the, the time to integrate? You, you gave an example of a, a company that had the, the robots on wheels and, and uh, carted them around. What would be the setup time in between? Um, I think, well, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, in, in those cases, if you're doing machine tending and you're just moving from machine to machine, um, the logic is similar, the process is similar, and the setup is, is a matter of, uh, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we have our arc welding customers who will, who will actually bring a new part into the cell uh, and, and program it and be ready for production in 15 minutes. That's their goal. Um, I think uh, another, another way to look at it is even for the first installation, um, many of our lean integrators are actually deploying cobots in as little as three weeks. In fact, um, Fusion Cobotics makes a, makes a commitment for a, a standard machine tending cell that uh, from purchase order to startup, they will have it, the job complete in just three weeks. Now, the other question that that quite often raises is, well, if your programming is that simple, I guess the robot can't handle any kind of complex project. That's not the case. I think the, the, our CTO uh, at founding Espen did a fantastic job of creating a very, very easy to use front end for straightforward applications, but then building the traditional complex tools on the background for those who want to do more demanding applications. Very good. Here's a question from the aerospace industry. Um, uh, being in facilities maintenance um, with a major uh, aerospace manufacturer, I dealt with sanding robots and have always been interested in them. What are the applications for aerospace? Uh, actually, I would recommend that you go look at a systems integrator based in Texas called Kane, K-A-N-E, Kane Robotics. Uh, Kane specializes in uh, surface finishing and material removal uh, in the aerospace industry, and they are scripting paint, they are polishing, uh, they are cleaning everything from um, um, uh, cowlings to propellers and uh, everything in between. And I think if you want to learn a little bit about that, please go to the Kane Robotics website. You'll see a, get some great application examples. Thank you. Uh, what programming language does uh, a collaborative robot work on? Well, in our case, it's called Polyscope. Uh, it, is, uh, it is our programming language. Um, and 
I think you'll see from the other manufacturers, each will have their own philosophy or strategy for programming. I think one of the advantages that uh, Universal had from the outset is we didn't have a legacy business. We were founded as a collaborative robot company um, and that's the only world that we've lived in. So consequently, our control architecture could really be, could be optimized uh, for collaborative applications from the very beginning. Good. Um, how can uh, cobots be set up at such low project costs? You, you gave a number of examples that pointed to that area. Yeah, I think there's no silver bullet. Um, I think the the uh, individuals uh, in house or even systems integrators that are successful um, are stripping cost out at every turn, um, and you can see it literally in the the programming. Um, you know, programming costs can be reduced readily. I think the UR Plus product family reduces engineering and programming cost. Um, I think you also have to acknowledge that time is money. And anytime you can get a project off your shop floor and into the customer within three weeks, uh, it reduces costs. Um, so really it's a, it's a matter of, of attacking every, every phase of the project cycle itself uh, and stripping cost out along the way. A couple of big savers are the you know, safety barriers and safety controllers, safety PLCs, sensors and interlocks um, actually add a significant cost factor to every cell. Um, and I think that's, that's been very, very, very good for us. I also think that the, uh, our robot's ability to run on 120 volts uh, is very uh, helpful. It reduces a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, power uh, wiring and rewiring out on the floor for installation, which again, helps with the project cost. And then finally, our online training academy strips away thousands of dollars of training cost for a typical cell. Thank you. Um, where can someone learn more about uh, risk assessments? I think the best place to learn about um, all manner of safety, whether it's uh, traditional automation or collaborative automation, uh, is the Robotics Industries Association, and that is uh, robotics.org. Uh, they actually uh, have uh, multiple training programs um, about safety in general and risk assessments specifically. The other recommendation I make is um, you know, depending on the size of your company and how many resources you have available, uh, there are a handful of consultants who are very well versed in risk assessment. And it's, uh, I think it's a really good investment to go use one of these, uh, one of these consultants for your first risk assessment um, as you, you know, kind of learn the process. And then you can decide if you want to bring that in-house in later on or still uh, continue to leverage the consultant, but it's a, a quick way to get started. Has a cobot been used to deliver water and air simulating a spray arm for a coating process? Yes, there are, um, there are a number of applications in the spraying and dispensing. Um, in fact, one that's uh, of great interest right now is um, is UR Cobots mounted on our sister company, Mir, who makes mobile robots. Uh, UR Cobot mounted on a Mir uh, mobile robot uh, to do spraying of, um, of sanitizing product, um, you know, in public spaces. Very good. Uh... Is there a list available of certified UR Plus products and does uh, Universal sell UR Plus products? A very good question. Uh, there's no printed or published list, but the best place to get um, absolutely up to the minute current listings is at the Universal uh, website and that's uh, universal-robots.com uh, from the main page in the top header just go to UR Plus, and then you can see complete listings of all the application kits uh, and components. Um, 
this is also uh, it's, it's actually very well thought out. Um, it's it's depending on where you are, what geography you're in, you will only see products that are readily available in your part of the world. Now, uh, the second part of that question is we do not sell the products, uh, but uh, really from the website, you can actually post an inquiry directly to the product manufacturer. Good. Um, can robots be redeployed to do other tasks? You, you gave a number of examples along those lines, but um, would, would a company typically have their programming all set for the next task and then just move it along and, and substitute that programming? How does that work? Well, I think there's two types of redeployment, right? So there's the day-to-day, hour-to-hour redeployment. Um, again, if you're a machine shop and you've got you've got a dozen machine tools and you may only have uh, eight cobots, um, machine tending is a straightforward operation, and you could redeploy that you know, those cobots to different machines quite readily. Again, a lot of people put them on carts. Uh, that's been a very successful. Um, if you're going to take a cobot out of a machine tending operation and put it into a welding operation, it's a little bit more complicated, but we actually see customers that do just that. Um, again, because it's easy to program and easy to set up, it is much easier to redeploy than traditional automation, and that may just be a matter of days. Good, thank you. Um, can two cobots work together in tandem? Um, they can coordinate together, but they do not work in tandem the way some of the traditional robot companies uh, will actually have uh, two robots in tight coordination to pick up a payload that's too heavy for either of the robots alone. Uh, so yeah, we, we actually do coordinate, but not at that level, if that was what the question was directed at. Yeah. Uh, can, can cobots be set up to do uh, lights out manufacturing? Yep, I had a couple good examples in there. Um, the typical approach is to, is to come up with a, a simple feeding system for blanks and for finished parts, uh, like a magazine. And you know that allows the robot to have a supply of blanks to load and unload um, in the machining application, for example. I think in other applications like welding, it's a little bit more difficult to do lights out. Um, although we do see companies that will actually fixture up uh, 20 or 30 sets of parts uh, at a time, and um, and then allow the robot to work on those uh, until complete. So we've got a, a few minutes left here. Uh, I would ask the audience if you come up with any additional questions, please type them in the interface as we're we're going through the last uh, last questions in the interface here. So. Um, please continue, and if we have any questions that we don't get to, uh, Joe will certainly um, answer those offline and post that with the archive version of the, the webcast. Uh, yeah, be happy question, to. Joe? Yeah. Um, what are the maintenance requirements for UR robots? Uh, they're actually quite simple. Um, un unlike the traditional approach, we don't have a you know a, a gearbox oil change regimen uh, or anything like that. The maintenance is uh, typically more of an inspection process to make sure the seals are intact uh, and that there's been uh, been no damage in those areas. Um, so it's it's minimal. It's absolutely minimal uh, preventative maintenance. And again, that's the that's the beauty of starting a product design with a blank sheet of paper and working in a in a very tightly controlled space. Good. And and last question, Joe, uh, any advice for somebody who just hasn't um, jumped into robotics yet and are looking to uh, wet their feet or appetite or look at where they should start? I, I think uh, I think one of the easiest things to, to, to figure out what your real personal aptitude or interest is would be to go to the UR Academy. Again, it's about two hours to do the basic modules um, and come through that and see see how you still feel about uh, about the technology and the process. 
And then I think the second step would be to go leverage the application builder uh, and start to put together some simple applications and see see how that looks and feels. Uh, to me, that's a really quick aptitude test to see if this is the kind of work that you would enjoy. Well, thanks everybody for the great questions. Uh, we'll get as many of the offline uh, questions answered as we can. And, and thanks to our presenter, Joe Campbell, for sharing uh, time and expertise with us and being a sport about answering so many questions. Uh, Happy I'd to. Like to. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the sponsor, uh, Universal Robots, for today's event. And now that we're about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. On behalf of Control Engineering and Universal Robots, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.